Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for our final webinar for the Zaire Institute during the fall semester. My name is Patience Kamau, and Howard Zaire will be hosting the webinar this evening, and our guest this evening is Janelle Sered. Um, we are also joined by our graduate assistants, Michaela waters Crintonton, who will, you'll see later on in our incoming uh, graduate assistant, um, who will not be on camera today, but you'll meet him next semester. Um, what will happen today is that I'll go over and give you a brief introduction to Zoom um, and what to expect through the next 90 minutes. Uh, Howard will, will introduce Danielle here shortly. Um, then there'll be a presentation that Danielle will give, and then we'll have a Q&A session that will be moderated by Howard Zare. We'll be followed by announcements by Michaela, and then we'll close at six o'clock. When we get to the Q&A session, uh, we just want to bring your attention to using the Q&A dialogue and not the chat box at the very bottom. That makes it so that you've, your questions don't get lost and are actually answered. So do not use the, uh, the raise hand feature or the chat box, use the Q&A dialog box. Thank you very much for joining us and I am going to throw it to Howard there now. Hi, Howard. Hi, thanks Patience uh, and, and welcome to all of you who have joined us today. We're pleased again, this is the last in this series for the fall, but we have a new series starting in January. You'll hear some of that toward the end. Uh, our topic today is a important one, transforming violence, restorative justice, violent crime, and an end to mass incarceration. And I'm very pleased to have our guest here, Danielle Sered. Uh, Danielle is the founder and director of Common Justice in Brooklyn, New York. Before that, she worked with Beer Institute, and then before that with, uh, with uh, Center for Court Inter Inter Innovation. Sorry. Uh, in both cases, working with reentry with youth, um, uh, in formerly incarcerated. Um, Danielle's done num uh, written several books. Uh, the Other Side of Harm, Addressing Disparities in Our Responses to Violence and Accounting for Violence, How to Increase Safety and Break Our Failed Reliance on Mass Incarceration. And I'm particularly excited about a new one that's coming out, Until We Reckon, Violence, Mass Incarceration, and a Road to Repair. Uh, Danielle has attend, attended Emory University, uh, uh, the New York University, and she had, was a Rhodes Scholar in Oxford, in England. I, Danielle is one of my favorite speakers. When I'm asked somebody that can really give a good, a good both visionary and grounded a presentation on restorative justice, Danielle is one of the first people I think of. So. I'm, I think it's a real treat to have to have you here today, Danielle. Um, so I'm going to turn it to you. You do what you want with it for a while, and then we'll get back together here after you had your say. How does that sound? Perfect. So thank you so much for that immensely generous introduction, and thank you to everyone who's here on the line today as we like crash toward the holiday season. Um, I'll talk for a little while and then we'll open it up for conversation just to make sure that the focus of what I talk about is the, actually what's most interesting to all of you. Um, I direct Common Justice, which is one of many restorative justice projects working in or adjacent to the criminal justice system, but is the first and only in the adult system to divert serious and violent felonies from prison. So we work with crimes like um, gunpoint robberies, stabbings, and shootings. And with the consent of the people harmed by that violence, um, the case is diverted into common justice where people go through an intensive process that includes a dialogue with those they've harmed. Um, after the dialogue, they reach agreements. It, or in the dialogue, they reach agreements about how to make things as right as possible. And if they complete the entirety of those agreements and the other requirements of the program, they don't go to prison and the felonies are removed from their record. And in the meantime, we provide wraparound services to the people who were harmed. 70% um, of the crime victims we've served are young men of color. 
that's not because we target young men of color. It's because if we do victim services equitably, um, that's what the distribution of our care looks like. Um, I started this work quite a while ago now, over a decade ago now, and I did that for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is that I understood then, as I do now, that we would never end mass incarceration unless we tackled the problem of violence. Um, more than half of people locked up in prisons in the United States are locked up for violent crime. And so if we only talk about reforms for nonviolent offenses, we are conceding um, a loss to the largest, the, what will remain, even at 50% its current levels, the single highest rate of incarceration in human history. Um, the day I was born, there were 443,850 people locked up in the United States. I'd ask any researchers on the line to try not to calculate my age too precisely. Um, and there are 2.3 million people locked up today, which means even if we were to think about a 50% reduction, we are conceding a threefold increase in incarceration in my lifetime, which despite the opinions of the adolescents I work with every day is not actually all that long. But the other problem with avoiding the question of violence is that mass incarceration isn't built, however much many, many people are incarcerated for crimes related to drugs, related to theft, related to other um, kinds of violations of the law that don't include physical harm. We don't build incarceration as a culture because of those crimes. We build it because of violence. The reason a people will choose um, prisons over schools and prisons over roads and prisons over hospitals and prisons over a living wage and all the other decisions we've made economically is not because we want to see people locked up for shoplifting or even for drug use, but because we've been told a story about some imagined monstrous other, like someone who is not quite as human as we are, someone who poses a danger to us and maybe even worse to those we love and someone from whom we have to be protected at all costs. And we've paid that cost. We've paid not only the $80 billion that incarceration costs us annually, but we've paid the cost and the trade-off to everything else we could have invested in. And we've paid the cost in an investment in a response to violence that simply doesn't work. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But all that aside, I actually believe that I could have entered the door into this work through a whole different part of my experience, other and apart from my commitment to ending mass incarceration. So say we say people who commit that kind of harm have violated the social contract and we owe them nothing any longer. Say that's what we believe. Um, the other door through which we enter this kind of transformative change is through a commitment to crime survivors. Um, so what we know is that survivors deserve responses to what happened to them that actually work and that actually produce safety and are actually conducive of healing. And there's nothing about mass incarceration that has been or ever stands to be any of those things. And so I actually believe very deeply at this point that even if we were completely and exclusively in a commitment to crime victims, that one would land at the conclusion that it is our moral obligation to end mass incarceration in our lifetimes. At Common Justice, we believe there are four key principles that should guide our responses to violence, and they're deeply resonant and overlapping with the principles of restorative justice, um, or at least restorative justice at its best. And so what I'll do is I'll talk through those four principles um, and some of how we see them in the work, um, and then open it up for question and conversation to make sure the remainder of our time together is focused wherever is most fruitful for everyone on the line. Uh, the first thing we believe is that responses to violence should be survivor-centered. We believe that the people who are hurt by an act of harm deserve a central place at the table um, in naming what that harm is, in naming its impact, and in defining what repair should look like. Um, we have a country that has done a great deal of criminal justice policy and practice in victims' names, but very rarely is the result of actually listening to the full range of crime victims. And when we listen to the full range of crime victims, what we find is an extraordinary appetite for something other than prison. At Common Justice, we only take cases into the program um, with the crime victim's consent. So it's important to start by remembering that fewer than half of victims call the police in the first place. I actually think that may be the most damning statistic about our criminal justice system, and I know there are many other contenders for that number one slot. But fewer than half of us when we are hurt 
believe that the criminal justice system is better than nothing. More than half of us prefer nothing to everything that it offers. After those half call, another half of those will drop off before the case gets to grand jury. So they'll call the police and either they will divest from the system or the police will not take the crime seriously and make an arrest or the prosecutor won't take it seriously. But whatever happens, another quarter, another half of those cases drop off. And so we're left with a quarter of crimes that even make it to that first stage in the criminal justice process. And it's those quarter of victims who we reach out to and say, do you want the person who hurt you incarcerated or do you want them in common justice? These are the victims who have gone the furthest down the pathway toward incarceration, who've engaged a system that many others don't, knowing that that system is likely to produce the incarceration of the person who hurt them. These are victims who have had guns to their heads, who have had lacerations to their livers, who have scars to their faces that may never fully heal. And we reach out to them, and they're the ones we say, do you want them in prison or in common justice? And 90% choose common justice, like 90%. Um, to me, it's the most important number we know. And when we first started to see that trend, at first I thought, um, you know, maybe people were better than I imagined, right? Maybe we were um, more forgiving and more compassionate and more capable of saying, you know, but for the grace of God, go I, that we were bigger believers in change. It gave me great hope about the human spirit. And I don't actually think that's what was going on. Um, I think that's probably true in maybe a quarter or a third of the cases we see. But that remaining huge portion of people who say yes, say yes because of something that I should have known as a crime survivor myself. Um, so survivors, like we will feel losses so deep that we want to like wring out our bones in case the pain is stored in the marrow there. And we will feel rage that makes us unrecognizable even to ourselves. And we will feel fear even in the safety of our own homes and even in the company of the people who love and protect us most. Like we will still tremble through the night. And the one thing that outranks all those things for us but runs concurrent with each of them is that we are pragmatic that at the end of the day, we make decisions that are in the interest of our safety and in the interest of other people's safety. Because the two things we can't abide as survivors are first, the thought of going through what we went through ever again, and second, the thought that anyone else would go through the same thing. 30 years ago, you could say to crime survivors, the thing that will ensure that you don't go through it again and that others don't either is incarceration. And at the time it made sense. Um, I came home once in Chicago to where I was staying with my dad to a decapitated head on the front lawn. I have no illusions about why people in that building asked for more policing and more punishment. It was partly because we knew that most of us were not hurting each other, right? That most of us were working two jobs and were caring for our families and tending to our loved ones and caring for our elders. And at worst, we were up to nonsense. You know, we were wasting our time and cheating on our girlfriends, but very few of us were committing harm. And we believed that if we could remove the few people who were doing these terrible things, and that the other ways we were with each other, the ways that involved kindness and generosity and community, that those ways would dominate and characterize our communities. But there was a mistake in that logic because that logic assumed that violence emerges out of some innate evil that only some of us possess. And violence doesn't emerge from innate evil. It emerges from sets of structures and conditions that make it almost inevitable. So in those same neighborhoods, when we removed people who committed violence, other people stepped into those positions. And that happened over and over again. And incarceration never kept its promise of safety um, because it never ever could. And so as survivors now, when we ask people, do you want common justice or do you want incarceration? They're not choosing common justice because they like innovation or because they want cutting edge criminal justice practice. Um, and they're not mostly choosing it out of mercy. They're choosing it because the status quo is unbearable, because the one option on the table has been proven to fail them, because the hardest people to persuade that incarceration works are people who live in neighborhoods where incarceration is common. I've compared it to someone who's lived for decades with really horrific migraines and who's taken medication for it, and the medication does virtually nothing to alleviate that pain. And if you ask that person, 
and say there's an experimental new drug, do you want to try it? And they say yes. It's not because they like innovation or because they have a high risk tolerance. It's because the current level of pain they're experiencing is not one they can continue to experience. And so the pragmatic choice is to elect to do something different. That's what I believe survivors who choose common justice do. And I believe they deserve not only the pathway to healing that they get from our restorative justice process, the answers they get to their questions, like why me and how dare you and was that a real gun and were you going to shoot and all the other things they need to know, the opportunity to express what happened to them, the impact on them, on their loved ones and how they still carry the pain through their lives and in their bodies and the opportunity to have some say in the outcome, to reverse the dynamic of powerlessness that characterizes trauma and actually get to influence what that repair will look like as the person to whom that repair is owed. I believe they deserve all of that. And they also deserve the wide range of supports we provide to them that have nothing to do with the person responsible. That's about their own safety, their own well-being, their own human development, their own families. Um, that they are entitled to those as survivors of crime whose needs we have totally abdicated our societal moral responsibility to meet. The second principle we believe in is that responses to violence should be accountability-based. Um, that sounds obvious. We always talk about holding people accountable. But typically when we talk about holding people accountable, we're talking about punishment. And punishment and accountability are not only not the same, they are often antithetical to each other. Um, punishment is passive. All you have to do to be punished is not escape it. Um, punishment requires nothing of us. Um, it, we endure it. There, there are huge moral questions about whether people should intentionally inflict pain on one another. Um, but whatever you believe about that, what is certainly true is that punishment does not require work. Um, accountability is different. It requires that we acknowledge um, what we've done, that we acknowledge the impact it had on others, that we express genuine remorse, that we take actions to make things as right as possible, ideally in a way defined by the people harmed, and that we become someone who never commits that kind of harm ever again. That labor will be to some of the hardest labor any of us ever do in our lives. It's our belief that when we hurt people, we owe something, period. That even if we ourselves are survivors, however much our survivorship entitles us to healing, it does not get us out of the obligation of repair that arises from our human dignity and therefore is always undiminished. So we know that we owe it to be accountable. Um, I've often said that, you know, we, we have all sorts of frameworks to think about healing and grief. We talk about the stages of grief and moving through to acceptance and all of these things. We understand it as a process that reconnects us, like those of us who have been harmed or suffered loss to our hope, to our dignity, to our connection with others and to our capacity for love. I believe accountability is the corollary to grief for those of us who have committed harm and that it's only through accountability that we reconnect to our hope and to our dignity and to our connectedness and to our capacity for love. And so when I say people deserve to be accountable, I mean it in both the toughest and most generous sense of the word. I mean, people do not deserve to escape accountability for the harm they have caused. I believe we are on the hook until we have fixed what we have broken and no amount of time gets us off the hook. But similarly, I believe that we as human beings deserve pathways to repair and that those pathways are the only things that lift us out of the shame we experience when we do things that we know are wrong. Um, so we believe accountability belongs at the center and we believe that punishment is not, doesn't support um, the kind of agency, the kind of active engagement in repair, the kind of transformation that accountability actually requires. The third principle we believe is that um, responses to violence should be safety driven. Again, we're used to a lot of rhetoric about harsh criminal justice policies producing safety, but we are not used to any evidence demonstrating that because that evidence doesn't exist. Punishment does not produce safety. Um, if it did, the United States would be the safest country in all of human history because no one has used punishment more than us. It does not work. And punishment in the form of incarceration in particular fails because of the very nature of incarceration. So I'm in the business of ending violence, first and foremost. Um, I came in, I'm in that business and came to restorative justice as the pathway to do so, as opposed to the reverse. 
And those of us in the business of ending violence know that the core drivers of violence are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. The four core features of prison are shame, isolation, exposure to violence, and an inability to meet one's economic needs. It means we have baked into our core response to violence in this country precisely the things that generate it. That is not what a country that cares about safety does. It is not what a country that cares about survivors does. It's not what a country that values communities does. Like if we are serious about producing safety, we have to engage in practices that actually get at the drivers of violence on both individual and structural levels that transform or uproot those so that safety is actually a reasonable outcome to expect from what we are doing. Incarceration is not positioned to make us safe. It is the wrong tool. Using incarceration to reduce violence is like throwing a Molotov cocktail into a house to put out a house fire. That is not what people who want to see the flames die down do. And so as a country, we have a choice about whether we want to be a punishing nation or a safe nation. And so far we have chosen the, for we've chosen the former and we've done it in the names of all the people whose lives depend on our choosing the latter. And so we have a choice as a nation now to say we actually prefer safety to punishment, that we prefer accountability, we prefer things that work to things that sell, um, we prefer things that will keep us and our families whole as opposed to things that will keep elected officials in their seats, at least temporarily, um, though some of our recent local elections suggest different trends. Um, but that we have an option to select safety in a way that is actually deeply aligned um, with our most deeply held human values. The last thing um, we believe is the responses to violence should be racially equitable. That means first and foremost that we understand who crime victims are. We understand that a young man of color is 10 and a half times more likely than me as a white woman to be robbed or assaulted. And that we as a country have never provided them with anywhere near the victim services we provide to other survivors. And that that same kind of inequity holds true for a whole range of survivors, including LGBTQIA survivors, immigrant survivors, other women of color, all sorts of folks who are excluded from the infrastructures that provide care to people who have been hurt. Um, Racially equitable responses to violence require understanding the deep inequities in the criminal justice system that begin at arrest and are compounded at every single point, like at every point in the criminal justice systems, disparities increase rather than diminish. That's at arrest, it's at arraignment, it's at what bail is set, it's at what crimes are charged, it's at what offers are made, it's at what plea deals are arrived at, what sentences are set, what parole is offered, when parole is revoked, every single moment in that system is characterized by racial disparities. And so it is not a system that will become equitable based on a handful of little tweaks, or frankly, a couple new really conscious administrators, however critical those are. Um, we have to understand that. And if we are going to ask people who have committed violence to be responsible for it, it is my deeply held belief that we as a nation have to be responsible for the harm that we have committed. We chose incarceration when there was no evidence it would produce safety. We chose it knowing that it would be form the basis and continue to exacerbate racial inequity in this country. We chose it knowing that it was a mechanism of degradation and harm to people who cause violence. We chose it knowing many survivors were telling us they wanted something else and we were ignoring them. And we are on the hook for that. So just as people who, I said, people who commit individual harm owe that repair until it's made and that no amount of time alleviates that burden, I think that is also true for us as a nation. But I believe that the same steps that work for repairing individual harm are part of what our pathway to repair as a country will look like. That's acknowledging what we did, acknowledging its impact, expressing genuine remorse, repairing the harm to the degree possible defined by, in ways defined by the people hurt by it, and becoming a nation who will never do that again. And so I think we are due as a country for a reckoning. I think we have long been due for one. Um, most people and most nations don't choose reckonings willingly. I think ours is being chosen for us more and more by the day. And I don't think we who do restorative justice know everything, but we know a thing about reckoning. We watch our participants heading into a circle process um, absolutely terrified. 
Like we watch our responsible parties who can hold a gun steady as day with their hands trembling as they consider facing the 14 year old boy they hurt and that boy's mother. Like we watch the terror they have as they sit down and have to acknowledge the pain they've caused to another human being that they know they have no right to cause. And in those processes, almost every single time, the agreements we hope to reach are reached, the clarity we hope to achieve is achieved, and then something else is also possible. There's a way of like being in the world that becomes available to us when we have repaired harm. Our responsible parties can access their dignity and their self-worth and their pride in a way they could not so until they laid down the burden honestly and committed truly to repair. Um, and so I believe that there is a future that is only possible on the other side of reckoning. I believe as a nation, like it is time for us to walk through that wall of fire, terrifying as it might be, um, and to engage in exactly the kinds of processes of repair that those of us who practice restorative justice have the huge blessing day in and day out to witness and to be reminded over and over again about what is possible for us as a people. And so I will stop there and open up for questions and at any level, you know, from like high big picture questions to particular questions about um, what our work at Common Justice looks like in practice. Thanks. Well, thank you. And, and I know that you're listening can see why I'm so enthusiastic about hearing you speak. Um, the first question does have to do, uh, your, the first question does have to do with, um, with your program specifically, the question is, can you give an example of how many cases you worked on with violent uh, felonies that have diverted them to non-prison tracks? Sure, about 100. All right. And then it says, uh, this is a hard one, how can organizations who might want to work on similar things work with you or connect mm -hmm. with you? Um, so there are a couple of things. Um, we run a national network called Healing Works, um, which is a connected, it connects people around the country who are committed to advancing healing equity. Um, and so that means people who recognize the disparate treatment of crime survivors around the country and who are interested in elevating um, the voices of crime survivors in larger efforts to both bring equity to themselves as survivors and to advance more equitable solutions to criminal justice. And so our website is currently undergoing, undergoing a reconstruction, but shortly you'll be able to do all sorts of things at healingworks.org, including connect not only with us, but with each other. Um, so we are very deeply movement oriented people. We talk all the time about um, being interested in building a movement, not building an empire. And so very often our answer when people ask about connecting to us will be to facilitate people's connection with one another. We believe local partnerships are often the most important ones. Um, we believe that connections between restorative justice and organizing efforts are totally critical. Um, we believe connecting restorative justice, emerging restorative justice efforts with local efforts around advancing racial equity have to be definitive at the beginning. And so Healing Works provides um, a hub that is not restorative justice oriented, it is healing oriented. So it includes restorative justice, but also includes a wide range of other modalities for people to connect with one another um, and continue to grow this movement that has grown um, really dynamically in the last several decades. Yeah, the questions are coming in now, but, but one question that that raises for me is, uh, my friend Susan Herman, who I think you probably know as well. Very well. Uh, yeah, she always used to say, I'll believe restorative justice when, when uh, services are provided to victims, even yeah. if no one's been identified or you know, no one causing the harm has been identified. I gather your program offers a variety of services like that. Sure, yeah, and, and Susan calls it parallel justice and her little book of parallel justice is a really great tool for people to learn more deeply about that framework. We do that in two ways. One is that if those, when I said 90% of victims agree to having the person who hurt them in common justice, the 10% who say no, we still provide services to them. So we don't say we'll help you, but only if you let this person go. We'll say we'll help you because what happened to you is wrong. 
And so we do have victims we serve in that capacity um, who are not participating in the restorative process. But then we also know that so many of these cases aren't going to reach the criminal justice system, result in an arrest, result in an indictment. And so we offer groups to survivors of violence around New York City, um, where people can talk about their trauma, talk about their experience, um, and begin to come to decisions and practices together that work to help them heal. And then Healing Works brings those people together with folks around the country committed to the same thing. There's a, two questions that sort of overlap. One of them is, have been able to use it with intimate partner violence? And the other one says, are there, hi, Danielle, are there any issues, harms, crimes that common justice wants to hand up, but for one reason or another can't or is not allowed to, thinking about things that rise to the level of sexual assault, murder, and so forth? And if so, can you say more about what you would hand, how you would handle such? You could. Sure. So, and the other is, this, are there issues that you, mm -hmm. cases that you're not being allowed to handle that you could? Mm -hmm. So, um, we do not work on intimate partner violence and sexual assault at Common Justice. Um, that is not because we don't think that work is critical. It's because we think it's different. And one of the mistakes mass incarceration makes is to presume that a single tool is going to solve all of our problems. Like if you bought a toolbox and it was like, these are all the tools you need for your house and you opened it and there were just 15 hammers, you would think that toolbox was bullshit. Um, and so we, it's really important when we think about restorative justice that we don't make the same kind of mistake and presume that any solution we develop can be applied universally to all kinds of harm. So while we don't work with those kinds of harm, absolutely restorative justice can be applied to intimate partner and sexual violence. There are places around the country where that is happening. Um, people like Sonia Shah and Sujatha Baliga have given really deep thought to this and done some of that work themselves. Um, and so it's an entirely possible thing, but those kinds of harm and the underlying drivers of them are different. The trick is if you're punishing someone, you don't have to understand why they did what they did or what it will take to transform it in order to punish. Um, if you're in the business of transformation, you have to understand those things. And so getting at underlying patterns of power and control, getting at like the toxicity of male supremacy, all of those sorts of things. Um, while we do those in ways that are ancillary to our core work, it's not who we are centrally. We don't work, we have not worked with murder cases. It doesn't mean we never would. It is highly unlikely that a prosecutor is diverting a um, murder from prison entirely. Um, there have been cases where dialogues have given people a lot of peace, and there have been cases even where dialogues have contributed to shortening sentences, um, and tons of cases where victims have advocated for the sentences to be shorter. Um, but diversion of murder is a far reach. We would do it um, if we were called to do it. I think one of the hardest things in a murder case, honestly, is to determine who has the authority to decide what response is just. And so it's, if you say it's the state, whether you think it's right or wrong, it's simple. But when you start to defer that authority to the people who are impacted, very often families grieve in very different ways. And so you will have someone's mother who wants someone buried under the jail and someone's sister who wants a dialogue and someone's father who won't even speak about it for six more months. Um, and so we've struggled with the consideration of how we would discern who the rightful decision makers are in the absence of the person um, whose life was ended and who undoubtedly is the person who if any of us could ask, we would. Um, so we don't yet work with murders. We've worked with a number of attempted murder cases though. So we get, um, we do get pretty close. I'm gonna, thank you. I'm gonna stick with some pro, kind of program related questions for a little bit here. Uh, one person just wants to know, where's the name come from, Common Justice? What? What, why, why that name? Um, it's sort of two things about, I mean, one is the sort of commonality is I think first getting away from the idea that the interest of um, victims of crime and the interest of people who cause harm are inherently opposed. Um, the idea that it's inherently adversarial, it's an inherent zero sum game. The truth is that the answer that is right for one is very often the answer that is right for the other. That's because violence happens in community, it happens in relationship, it happens in context. And so the transformation of both those parties is almost always in both parties mutual and common interest. But the other thing is that like what we're doing is really common. Like it is not new and fancy. We have a stick 
We pass it around. You talk when you have it. You don't when you don't. We ask people what happened. How do we fix it? Um, and so people talk about this as a cutting edge, innovative solution to violence. And this is the oldest, simplest way we've ever had and known to address harm. Communities across the world, everywhere, for generations on generations on generations, have done some version of this. If you, can, if you don't want to kill people, and you don't want to exile people, and you don't want to throw people in a cage. You have to answer the question of what are we going to do to address what happened? And the vast majority of societies and communities come up with some answer that is related to the practices we call restorative justice. And so I think it's really important that we not hold it as a shiny new thing um, and that we honor its commonality and its simplicity, um, not as something that downgrades its value, but as something that defines it. I also needed a name that both prosecutors and 19 year old young male crime victims and people who shot people and funders could all say. And so you can imagine the ones that fell off that list. Well, not so highfalutin that people rolled their eyes, right? Correct. Uh, somebody's asking, do you work with probation officers and parole officers to reduce probation or parole? No, we're only alternative. We only work with cases that are prison bound. Okay. Um, so parole, once people are coming home, we work as an alternative to incarceration. So we only work with cases where the person would have been incarcerated, but for their engagement with us. There are parole and probation officers all over our work because some our participants have multiple cases. Some are under other forms of supervision. And so in that way, we absolutely coordinate with them. But we are very strictly, um, we are here to displace mass incarceration. Okay. Here's a question that overlaps with what you've said, but I'll ask it. Uh, I'm very interested in how a restorative justice orientation may look in a, oh, I'm sorry, that's not the one I want yet. This thing keeps jumping up and down as people add questions to it. In what ways does common justice interface with criminal legal actors and the system as a whole? You've sort of answered that, but you may want to say more. And how is common justice laying the groundwork for the understanding that transformative justice is not an alternative to incarceration, totally. but an entirely different project, an entirely different way of being with one another. So we are situated like deep in the heart of darkness at the center of the criminal justice system. Um, once a case has been indicted, the only actor who has the power to keep that person from going to prison is the prosecutor. And so we work in partnership with prosecutors. Um, the Brooklyn District Attorney has been the bravest and boldest on this of any of his colleagues around the nation. Um, the Bronx District Attorney just joined in more recently and is taking similar steps with us. And so we secure their consent and their promise that if someone completes the program, they will dismiss the felony charges against them um, and consent to not see that person doing any jail or prison time. So it means like this morning I was in court and this afternoon my staff is in a circle. And so um, we straddle those really fundamentally different spaces. And one of our core tasks is to help our participants shift from what we think about as extrinsic to intrinsic motivation. So from being motivated by the threat of a sanction from a court or a judge to being motivated by their own internal compass, by the word they gave to the people they harmed, by their desire to repair. And so part of what we're most proud of in our work is for most of our graduates, by the end, the judge becomes pretty irrelevant. The judge is extremely irrelevant at the beginning. The DA is extremely irrelevant or irrelevant at the beginning. And by the end, like they aren't not hurting people because they might get caught or might get punished. Um, they're not hurting people because uh, they, um, they want to be people who don't hurt people anymore and they think they owe it to people to engage in that change. Um, in terms of, I th absolutely agree, I think the phrase alternative to incarceration is ridiculous and continues to reinforce the notion that incarceration is, an, is deservedly the default. Um, I think more, I, like, I believe in the role of, incar the legitimate role of incarceration in a country um, or in a society is to hold the people we are not capable of safely holding in our communities. That's not a static answer. Like as we develop more and more community capacity to hold people who have caused different kinds of harm, incarceration becomes obsolete. Like it becomes a source of harm that offers no benefit. And so I think a lot about 
um, like we think about abolition as a destination, not a strategy. Um, like it's not a thing you do, it's a place you get. Um, and we believe very deeply that the way you get there is not just by shrinking the current system, but by building the things that will displace it. And so I think a lot about like Uber and Lyft and putting aside for a moment my politics around organized labor, um, which would have me boycott both of those all the time. Um, the way Uber gets people to use their service is not by running attack ads on taxis. They're not like taxis are shitty. They're never there when you need them. They're smelly. We hate taxis. What they do is they say, you know, what do people want out of taxis? Which of those things are they getting? Which aren't they getting? And so long as they can provide all the things people are getting and at least one of the things people aren't, they will displace it. People will choose it. And so for us, we think about like as we develop the capacity to address harm in our communities more and more, like as we strengthen those muscles, which are long existing, like that doesn't mean only developing new programs. It means honoring the people in community who keep people safe, the people who are always the first there after there has been a, a serious conflict or act of serious harm, trying to de-escalate, trying to intervene. So it means the elevation of practices that are indigenous to neighborhoods um, and inherent to human nature um, and expanding and strengthening and investing in those in both resources and in energy in a way that gives us room to to not just shrink incarceration but to fully crowd it out good does does common ground have any mechanism to work with people after they've finished maybe a restorative process in order to help them uh, stay out of crime to become more productive. Yeah, we work with them for years. They become like family to us. They stay in leadership in the organization. Absolutely. Uh, I thought so. Uh, does that, do you think restorative and healing work is more difficult with adult population than with young people in, in, a, in terms of helping guide long-term change within the person? I mean, so we work with 16 to, people who are 16 to 26 at the time they commit crime. So it is the adult system, but they're still young adults. Um, and honestly, I think healing work is, is always the hardest shit we ever do. The only thing that might be as hard as healing is accountability. Um, and so the, for any of us, I don't think there's a point where we age out of our capacity to heal and transform. Like I know all of the literature on adolescent development that kind of speaks to the continual development, the malleability of the adolescent brain, consequential thinking, all of those things. And certainly those things, engaging somebody at a moment in which they are changing makes it easier to in introduce other kinds of change. Um, but I believe adults keep changing all the time. Um, and and I, think, I think healing is not, real deep healing is never easy. The question is like, are we supported and courageous enough to kind of steer into the skid. Um, and I think for many of us that, like, we're lucky if it comes when you're young. For many of us, it doesn't come until a lot later. Good. Uh, I'm very interested in how restorative justice orientation might look in a counseling setting, working with victims of crime. While this is not where the group work would happen, could accountability and personal growth motivated by restorative justice continue in this setting? If so, how or have you seen it done? So I'm really particular about what I mean by restorative justice. So I think restorative justice is a decision-making process in which the people directly impacted by an event um, come together to determine a course of action um, to address what happened. And so that means that it involves all those directly impacted and it involves decision-making. There are a ton of other things that are restorative practices, that are restorative in orientation, um, but to be restorative justice for me, it's decision-making, it's action-oriented, it's the people involved at coming together to make that decision. Um, and so I think it's really, I think part of the challenge the restorative justice movement faces um, is the breadth of how we use that term. I mean, people use it to describe like units on jail, they use it to describe like teen courts, they use it to describe like after school programs, anytime people sit in a circle. Those things are great. And many of them share some of the core principles that I, that I introduced earlier, being sort of centered around survivors, oriented around accountability, all of that. 
Um, but I'm really cautious against um, diluting what it is we mean by restorative justice. Um, that said, um, certainly these principles have a place in, in other settings and, that, and those processes aren't always available for thousands of reasons. And so um, I believe for people who have caused harm that um, a pathway to accountability and repair is hands down the best way through the shame and out of the pattern. And I believe for those of us who have survived harm, um, being able to engage with what has been done with us in a way that like centers and to the degree possible restores our own power is totally critical. Um, and so I see those things as like deeply allied interventions, but I wouldn't call them restorative justice. So. That, that's very helpful. What are some of the biggest challenges in the day-to-day -day operations? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and working with different um, colors. Where do you start, right? Right. I mean, the I would say the biggest challenge is white supremacy, um, hands down, and that that shows up in the limitations of the criminal justice system um, and the difficulties in those partnerships, um, what it is built to do, the way it's oriented, um, like how that train goes on its track if it's not disruptive. Um, the hardest thing is that our participants, like our responsible parties, um, just because they decide they're willing to change doesn't mean the world around them changes. And in fact, it would be easier if that mistake I talked about earlier were right and that violence came out of evil because then when someone decides not to be evil or you know commits to being good, then it ends. But because violence is driven by structural factors, poverty doesn't change, poor education doesn't change. Sometimes I think the biggest barrier to our success, like greater success in New York is the housing market in New York. Like people cannot afford a safe place to live. Um, the police's behavior doesn't change just because people's do. Um, and so people who have been arrested a lot in the past will often get arrested in the future even if their behavior changes substantially. Um, the biggest challenge is you'll notice nothing on that list is like, our responsible parties are big jerks and they don't want to admit what they did. Um, once in a while, they're jerks and don't want to admit what they did, but that's hardly, it's A, very rare, and B, like we are built for it. And so um, that's never the hardest thing. Um, the hardest thing is um, supporting people transforming in a context that has resisted transformation for generations. A couple here, you mentioned, please, a couple questions here about whether you work at all with local police or where you see the relationship between restorative justice and law enforcement? Mm -hmm. um, so we work with prosecutors, not police, and that's just because we're post-indictment. Um, and so by the time a case is at the stage where we engage it, it's, you know, it's in the hands of the prosecutors instead of the police. Um, I'm not someone who believes in having law enforcement in those circles. Um, because when I said before that restorative justice brings the people directly impacted by harm together, law enforcement's not directly impacted by the harm. Um, and I think it's, I think from my vantage point, it dilutes uh, um, the power of that process. Though many people whom I respect really deeply will have law enforcement in the room when they think um, it stands to have a transformative effect, often on the law enforcement members who are there, not on the others. Um, so we, but we have good relationships with some folks at the NYPD um, because we need to. Um, but for the most part, the make or break actor around these things will be the DA. One of which is a former student of mine, I think, if he's still there. But uh, another, just, just thinking about that. Uh, here's a question in regards to educating and engaging people who are not aware of how transforming and empowering restorative justice practices are. What are different methods for convincing people how transforming and empowering restorative justice can be? I'm finding that until someone participates in a circle or conference, they often can't see its value. I'm looking for alternative ways to get buy-in from institutional and community stakeholders without them having to go through a circle process. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think two things. I mean, one is I think we, it's, you'll be hard for us to find anyone who doesn't have some harm in their lives who could, that could use transformation. And so I think thinking about opportunities for them to 
um, engage in processes to transform their own stuff instead of just witness other people transforming stuff is really great. Um, and then I think storytelling is really important. I think people who have been through these processes are incredibly compelling messengers of what they can do. I think if you tell stories in ways that are accountable and where the people whose lives are being talked about get to shape um, what that looks like, um, that that can be real catalytic for a change. Um, and then I think you get people to buy in because it works. Um, you don't have to get people to buy in. Like I had one like mean old ADA um, who I think probably would self identify as mean and old. Um, <laughs> who said to me once, he's like, you know, you say all this shit all the time. That's like all this corny shit. Do I have to agree with you about why it works or can I just acknowledge it works? And I was like, you can just acknowledge it works. Um, and he was like, all right, I'll give you that. Right. That's what I needed from him. And so I think while I'm very deep believer in the transformation of hearts and minds and spend most of my waking hours trying to do that in some form or another. Um, I also think it's really important to understand like what you need somebody to do and what it takes to get them to do it. And I think as restorative justice practitioners, we can think that ev the solution to every problem is the transformation of hearts and minds. Um, and while that would be lovely, like sometimes it's about leveraging power. Like sometimes it's about making people understand that this is what the constituents who elected them want to see have happen. It's about making them understand that their institutions are and have to be committed to it and will be held accountable for it. Um, and so I don't think that like the just exercise of collective power in the context of a democracy is in any way antithetical to the ideas of restorative justice. And that sometimes um, like one of my mentors in the criminal justice movement says, you know, you don't win because you're right, you win because you're strong. Um, there is nothing wrong with also developing our strength, not only our capacity to persuade. I'm going to move to some more general questions, then maybe come back to some specific ones. There's a number of questions about how we expand this. There's specific questions as common justice going to be expanding outside your area. There's questions about what what particular skills are needed to build a movement. Uh, one person says, for instance, what would you define as critical elements or skills to building a movement at a personal or organizational level? So there's a number of these questions about building, about spreading the word, building a movement. What, what do you have to say about that? Sure. So no one organization builds a movement ever. Um, so when I say we contribute to like movement building, um, movement building is always collective. That's the nature of it. Um, and so, um, so it's, it requires relationship, right? And it requires long standing relationship. It requires um, relationships of like reciprocal accountability, um, which are super laborious to build and absolutely always worth it. Um, we are, Common Justice will answer within the next year the question about whether we will replicate or train others and how. And part of the tension we face in that is on the one is that um, it rubs up against two of our most deeply held values, which come into conflict in answering that question. That first value is that we believe unequivocally in the importance of local leadership. We believe people know their places better than anyone from outside ever will. Um, we believe in elevating that local leadership and deferring to it. Um, we don't believe in displacing local work, certainly not with a big national organization ever. And at the same time, our practice is rigorous as fuck. Pardon my language. We're after five o'clock in New York, so you'll get a little potty mouth. It's inevitable. Um, we, I mean, our graduated sanctions when people are absent, like if someone is five minutes late, they stay 10 minutes extra. If they're 15 minutes late, it's a technical absence. If they're absent, they do two makeups. Like we've learned the difference between what happens if our men's group is on Tuesday versus Thursday. If we do one makeup versus two, if we do, like we are highly, highly particular and super rigorous in the fidelity of our model. And that's because when we fail, people get hurt. Um, it's not with all respect to like a GED program. When a GED program fails, people don't pass the GED. When we fail, people get shot. Um, and so we have to be nearly perfect all the time. 
and the tension between the level of rigor that I think is required, honestly, only for very serious violence. Um, if we're talking about far low level, like much lower level crime, I think the risk tolerance, even just the moral risk tolerance should be much wider. Um, but we're stuck between, in a hard place between reconciling, on the one hand, what we understand is our moral commitment to um, absolute excellence and precision and to leveraging every single lesson that we have learned over the last decade. Um, and on the other hand, our deeply principled commitment to local leadership. And so it's like in sorting out that tension that we'll be able to answer the question of what our growth will look like. Um, but there are many people around the country building aligned work who we talk to and help all the time. Um, and that's part of, um, part of movement orientation is doing a lot of things that'll never have your name on them. Um, and understanding that in many ways as a bigger win than the things that do. And I would assume that networking with community organizations is a pretty important part. Absolutely. Anybody would do someone has asked something about that. Including yeah. here locally. Like we don't run a GD program. We partner with people. Like we don't run a community service program. We partner with people. Like we do like there we don't do anything that others do well. Like we do that through relationship and um and through commitment to each other. So I was asking here if you have any specific recommendations. I mean any specific resources to recommend for someone who wants to start a restorative justice movement in their community. We've covered that to some extent in other webinars. Yeah, nothing more specific than what I've offered. What's that? Nothing more specific than what I've offered. Okay. Yeah. Um, one person's asking, how do you, like a community like Denver that has some restorative justice going on, schools and so forth, but how do you expand that? Do you have anything beyond what you've said about how to expand that? I mean, I think the way you expand you expand it by building power. Um, like you expand it by creating, by organizing, by developing a public constituency who make a demand for something more. Um, and I think you do expand it by doing trainings and persuading people and changing the hearts and minds of key actors and getting buy-in in institutions. Like you do all of those things. Um, but you also, you, sit, you build in the communities where people's lives are at stake and whether that expands or not. Um, and you help those, communi those community members exercise their power to ensure the expansion of the thing that is in the interest of their families, of their own well-being, of their safety. And so I think very often the solution is, um, the solution is one that is about um, leveraging and developing collective power. And that's, there's very little restorative justice. There are very few restorative justice programs anywhere that grow or develop in that way. We grow mostly through persuasion um, and mostly through individual relationship um, and are, I think would benefit really greatly from being much more deeply connected to the best and brightest organizers around. A couple of questions, and you may have answered these, but questions around, can you say anything more about specific services you offer to those who have been harmed and also to support uh, those who caused the harm later on. Is there more you want to say about that? So our, sir, uh, there, uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of massive. Um, our responsible parties go through a 15 month program. They see us every day. There's an intensive curriculum around violence intervention. We support their stability in terms of housing, income, engagement and positive activity, healing through past trauma, all of that. So the work is vast and kind of all encompassing. And for our crime survivors, those same kinds of things are on the table, but they're not required to do anything. Like we don't owe anything for being hurt. And so our services for survivors are a lot more variable because they're guided by what survivors want. And so some of it is restitution or victim's compensation. Some of it is counseling. Some of it is safety planning. Some of it is relocation. Some of it is um, changing a career or educational pathway. Like it's a wide range of things. And so, um, our staff have to be like nimble and responsive um, and ready to understand that trauma doesn't respect boundaries. And so um, 
the pain we experience doesn't stay in one part of our lives. And so very often the place where people want help and help and support um, doesn't look immediately like a result of what happened to them. Um, and we trust them that it is um, and work with them in a vast array of things in their lives. Yeah, judging by the website, you have a fairly good sized staff by now. Mm-hmm. But somebody's asking here, what do you do when you don't have money for training and to get started? Yeah. You might want to say something about how you got going. Um, I mean, I, I spend a ton of time raising money and it's a ton of work. Um, and I think talking to people who um, raise money, um, like lear- raising money is a particular craft. And so um, like doing it through partnership is always like finding partners that reduce the cost is helpful. Um, and then finding people in your jurisdictions who raise money and ha- like it can help you develop that capacity is just super important. Um, and then most restorative justice that happens happens for free. Like it happens in our families and it happens in our street corners and it happens in relationship. And so there are all sorts of things we're doing that we could do in a different way instead. So there are plenty of ways to start in the absence of resources, but like resources matter. I believe people should be compensated for work. I think America has a pretty shitty history of not paying for labor. I think we gotta be better about it. Um, and so there are places like the Foundation Center that have huge directories of grants and also a lot of foundational training on like how to raise money, how to write successful proposals, all of it. Um, but building those kinds of things, I think it, I think it matters to resource efforts because I think I do believe that people who do this work deserve to make a living wage um, and deserve to be compensated for what is like really critical and like socially critical labor. Um, and so, so for us, like we have, you know, we pay our staff. I get pushed back for how, from state agencies about how much we pay our staff because they think it's too much because it's more than our peers. Um, and I think what we're doing is to the degree we can actually valuing their work in a way they deserve to have it valued. And so that's always the tension is like between the shoestring, how you balance a shoestring budget and on the other hand, um, a commitment to the really like fair compensation of labor, you know, to be important. That raises another question. Somebody's asking, how do you take care of your own needs and needs of your staff and given all that and the fact that you're seeing violence so openly? Yeah. Um, I mean, so I really appreciate Miriam Kaba, who's like, talks about hating the term self-care. She's like, I believe that like our care is collective. Um, And she does all the things that all of us do. Like she goes to yoga and takes baths and meditates and like all of the things that are those things. Um, I know for many of us, um, a lot of what sustains us is relationship, right? Um, You can't do this work and avoid working through your own pain. It's not an option. Um, The gift of it is it like continually gives you tools to work through your own pain. Um, We hear the phrase vicarious trauma all the time. And recently I heard someone use the phrase vicarious resilience, which I appreciated so deeply. Um, Like that there is something about the other side of being around trauma all the time is that we are also around transformation all the time. And part of the work of the organization is to make sure we're always able to absorb both. And so um, everyone on our staff gets a thousand dollars a year wellness benefit that they can spend on anything wellness oriented. Um, All of our supervision includes a lens around vicarious trauma um, and space to check in and like ample space to process what's happening. Um, people are supported in doing that here and supported in doing it elsewhere. Like we give people really good health insurance um, so that people can access therapeutic and other services and like take care of their bodies and all of those things. Um, but we also understand like trauma, one of the, you know, trauma is, um, it's like kryptonite to creativity, but it also means that creativity um, combats trauma. And so that means in our own lives, engaging in creative projects are really helpful but also that like creative problem solving and getting to try new things and getting to do new things, like being an organization that nurtures creativity 
um, is helpful as an antidote to vicarious trauma. Um, we encourage people to go home and to sleep and to take care of our, themselves. Like we don't value, we don't praise people for always responding at 9 p.m. at night. Like if I write an email after five o'clock, I save it as a draft and send it in the morning. Wow. Um, I think it's super important as a, like, if you're going to ask people to work on violence, don't fucking email them after five o'clock. Um, like let to like, and to not mistake um, anxiety for urgency. Um, so that when there is something that uh, to not communicate a spirit of emergency around things that aren't emergencies, like we have enough emergencies that only things that involve like prison or safety get to pull the fire alarm here and other things that are in other organizations would be emergencies, like other kinds of deadlines or challenges that arise. Like we hold as things that are urgent, but not as things that can merit our collective panic. Um, and I think it's really important that leadership model that. Um, and then I think it's incredibly important that there is space to talk all the time about structural racism and the structural drivers of violence and the context in which these things happen. Um, violence is both easier and harder to face when we understand it as bigger than single incidents. Um, but in terms of how folks hold it and the kind of pain it causes to carry it, um, zooming out is often a really important dimension of keeping it together. Here's a question from someone, an MSW student who says she's read both of our books in her, in her classes. Uh, she's working at, in looking at, uh, working in forensic social work in a defense-based setting and wanting to know thoughts on how social workers can get involved and for students to get involved with common justice or restorative justice, I suppose. So we have an internship open that students can apply to. Um, and so in terms of getting involved in common justice. And then I think, um, I think there are so many principles in social work that are extraordinarily valued, valuable to restorative justice work. And I think it's really important that we not equate the two with each other. So at Common Justice, for example, um, we hire based on competency and not credential. And so we know there are people who learn, who go to social work school and learn really critical things to do this work. Um, there are people who go to social work school and manage not to learn those things. Um, and then there are people who learn those things without going to social work school, which means that the degree is a really poor proxy for the skill. Um, and so if you mean like what the question, I was like, it was social work lowercase, uh, so lowercase w, and in that case, I'm like, yes. Um, if what we mean, and especially the principles, when we think about the, the roots of the social work discipline, it is very much about understanding individuals in their structural context um, and continually working with a hand on both, like never losing sight of individual agency and the individual capacity to transform and never looking, losing sight of the constraints a context places on what people can do and be and being in the rigorous work of transforming those contextual constraints. And so I think the most valuable thing um, social workers bring to this is it is when they can bring that, is when they can bring um, a capacity to always hold both the realities of structural violence and the realities of individual agency at the exact same time. All right, well, I'm, again, I'm jumping around a little bit. This, uh, there's so many questions coming in and the page keeps jumping and so it's really hard to track them here. But there's a couple policy related questions. One is a simple one, simple question. What's your opinion of the crime bill currently being proposed in con Congress? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, common justice doesn't have a public stance on this bill. Um, I am not a fan of it and and I think our conversation in the movement about it has been wrong. Um, like most of the conversation in the movement has been a debate about the value of incremental reform. And so some people are saying it doesn't go far enough. And so it's trash. And then others say like, it will impact 4,000 people who may come home differently and that's not nothing and we should do it. Um, and I think that conversation is the wrong lens. I think all policy reform is incremental. Like unless we are passing um, like reparations and an end to global capitalism, we're passing incremental reforms. Um, policy is also always a place of compromise. Like it's 
filthy, nasty work. Like you don't like getting dirty. Don't do policy work. It is not a place for purists. Like you can't walk through a field of shit in your white boots and be like, ew, on the other side. Nor can you look at someone who just came through that field and tell them that their boots are dirty. Like we know, like it's a dirty space. My concern with the First Step Act is not that it doesn't go far enough, because frankly, I think small steps forward are important. And I think that when we can secure the freedom of even a couple dozen people, um, that is everything to those people, to the people they love, to their communities. The problem with the First Step Act is the things like its underbelly, um, particularly the introduction of e-incarceration. So there's a reason um, Geo Group and a lot of the companies that are like prison profiteers are such strong supporters, um, is it introduces a vast expansion of the use of electronic monitoring, um, which is a continuation and extension of the ethos of incarceration. And many people believe, Michelle Alexander wrote a really compelling piece about it in the Times recently, um, is the next mutation of incarceration, you know, that we go from slavery to convict leasing to Jim Crow to this. Um, and that there are many reasons to believe that the expansion of e-incarceration on the horizon um, is a real grave danger um, and is wildly profitable. Um, it also does a lot to privatize um, the services within prisons, um, which has never been in the interest of incarcerated people. Um, and so it's not the fact that the bill is not ambitious enough that I think is the problem, though that's the debate we've been having. Um, the problem is not that it doesn't do enough good. The problem to me is that it also causes harm. Well, then uh, let me jump to this question. Do you see Mayor Ann or working with parallel efforts that are working within the outside the prison to promote improved services such as education, living conditions, restorative practices in an effort to curb reincarceration re and promote healing after and during incarceration? Uh, does that make sense? I think it has to do with how much to work within the existing system to improve things versus trying to change it. That, you still there? I, what? Are you still there? Yes. <laughs> did, did you get the question? Or I am. I don't that, know what else. You're thinking about it. Yeah, I'm here and answering. Okay. No, I'm here and answering. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Did you get the right. question? Yeah, uh, where did you lose me? I was talking the whole time. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, we got- Where did you lose me? The question was, the question was whether there's merit in working- Yes, with I got the question. Where okay. did I cut Yeah, then I didn't hear any answer after that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so yes, is the short answer. Um, I've compared it to the way an anti-war activist might support um, the quality of services in a veterans administration. Um, the fact that you don't believe in war and you believe it causes great harm doesn't mean you don't understand that the people who are still subjected to it are. Oops. Cut out here, Danielle. Where, I, I'm not hearing. Uh, patients, are you hearing? I think she's frozen. Uh, something went can you wrong see on her me end. Now? Can you oh. see me now? Now we're hearing yes, you. Now we can. Um, oh, with no, connected me. I didn't do a thing. The, uh, cool. you, you just, that the connection I think might be a little weak. Sorry about that. You just froze. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay, we'll try. Uh, oh my, the questions are just coming in here. Uh, people have, yeah, you were cut out here apparently. Um, Oh my goodness, where do we go here? Uh, there's a number of questions having to do with white supremacy movement and what what uh, this approach might have to do with the issues around that. Do you, uh, anything you want to say about that with that generalized kind of question? What's the question? 
Well, it has to do with working with issues around white supremacy and racism of that kind. And, uh, I'm not sure I'm following the questions quite. Can you repeat the question? I heard white supremacy. Let me go to a different one because the question isn't clear to me. Okay. Uh, we were talking about policy and the crime bill. We have several listeners in Brazil, and they're saying that Brazil has a national crisis around this. They've signed an agreement to start a project to reduce incarceration. Uh, what is your opinion? What actions would be more effective? Um, I'm not familiar with the legislation in Brazil. Not not either, if you were addressing a country like that, where would you suggest they start? I would never give advice to a country that I don't know enough about. So um, I would start with some humility. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. probably a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did, but I'm not the one for that question. Okay. Uh, they, they, people are wondering how you could use this success and data to work with other prosecutor's office or how they could begin to work with other prosecutor's office. Any yeah, talk with Glenn sure, Nyland. I mean, the things we make public are made public so people can use them. Um, and so our website is like full of information and publications and videos and articles and a ton of other things. And we put it up there not just so like our families can see how cool we are. Um, but that's so that people can leverage it. So leverage it. Um, like our work is meant to be a lever for aligned projects. And so um, like really welcome people um, putting it to good use where they are. Uh, I've been, you know, some people used to say that prosecutors were our biggest roadblock and then other people say, well, you know, actually it's defense attorneys, but <laughs> do you have any comments on that? So I'm obsessed with prosecutors because um, I've spent a decade of my life very close to them now. Um, and I think we're seeing this new wave of progressive prosecutors be elected on reformist platforms. I think it's incredibly promising. But the prosecutors who I'm most hopeful about, um, I think those prosecutors fall into two groups. There is a group of prosecutors who have persuaded the same base of likely voters to vote for them as a different candidate. And I think those prosecutors will be pretty good. And then there are prosecutors who have really animated a new base of voters and specifically voters in neighborhoods who are impacted by incarceration and violence. So people whose lives are at stake in the work that prosecutors do are now more and more coming to the polls and choosing who they want in that office. Prosecutors are, they are elected officials and they are ultimately answerable to their constituents. And I think at the point where the constituency, like when the people start to demand that prosecutors act differently, they will act differently. When the people stop measuring prosecutors by how many convictions they secure, and rather whether or not they use incarceration as a last resort and actually help increase safety, then prosecutors will act differently because they will lose their jobs if they don't. And so I'm extraordinarily, it's a hard moment in our country to be enthusiastic about representative democracy. But if you're looking at a place to bolster your enthusiasm about that, look at these DA races. Like they are changing the nature of criminal justice in this country. And prosecutors could end mass incarceration tomorrow if they wanted to. The degree of discretion and control they have in that process is so vast. And it means that when we get new people into those roles, a vast array of things become possible. There's a question, how do you respond when a, when a survivor who believed they found closure during the process changes their mind after a restorative justice process ended and the offender has met the terms of accountability. Healing and trauma aren't linear. Sometimes we miscalculate our needs down the line. Needs change after someone has reached a new level of healing. Um, I don't think we ever, um, I don't know that we've ever had anyone tell us they felt full closure, nor have we encouraged people to think about it in that way. Um, so we think about the, the moment they're with us on the restorative justice process as a, a stage in their healing um, and hope that it contributes the most it can to that stage. 
with a full awareness that you're exactly right, that healing is as nonlinear as anything comes, um, and that things change over time, and that we continue to hold space for that change and for the variety of things that might help people at other stages in the process. But I think it's super important not to overstate to survivors um, what the restorative justice process will do for them or to assume that they'll leave it healed or with anything closed. Like they should leave it with information. They should leave it with someone who's made commitments to them. Um, and they should be continuously engaged um, by people committed to their healing and well-being um, alongside and around and adjacent to that process. But I think the, the underlying th question, thing that that question points out that's really important um, is not presuming that a restorative justice process in itself is fully adequate to heal people um, and not presuming that when that process ends, that the healing process ends with it. Here's someone trying to understand what the costs of a program are. Let's say you have a lot of volunteers available. Why would you need money? Can you say a little bit about that? We believe in paying people for work. Um, like, I think people who do work should be paid. I think this is extraordinarily hard and important work. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's simplicity means that it's easy. Um, like, the work of being simple is actually very hard. Like, the Dalai Lama only says simple stuff. That's not because he's, like, easy peasy man. Like, it's, um, it's extraordinarily hard labor. And I think people get compensated to do all sorts of things that have nowhere near the social value um, of what a staff who does this do. And so um, I'm personally super into paying people for work. Um, that said, there's a ton of things that people can do in community and with volunteers. And, um, and particularly when those are not just like volunteers, like people who are zoop, like, parachuting into a community with like four hours to help, but that what community can do with each other, like what neighbors can do, even when they're not compensated, what people on a block can do with each other. I think the range of that is vast. Um, and I think the, the greatest strength that, that anchors whatever those people do, even absent more robust training, is the, the ongoing relationship and proximity. Um, what do you think is the best response to someone who uses their culture or identity as an excuse to perpetuate or cause harm? Like, I'm from Philly, so I can say whatever I want to, or I'm a male in the family, so I make decisions, and women just need to know their place, or I can use, uh, I'm a person of color, so I can use racial slurs whenever I want to. Um... <laughs> So those are, each of those provoke really different responses to me. It's why I'm hesitating. Um, I don't think anyone changes by being told things. And I don't think anyone changes by being made to feel smaller. Um, the entirety of our curriculum is questions. It's 15 months of questions in hour long increments. Um, we believe that everyone has within them the capacity to transform um, that people all have the capacity to understand the impact of their harm. Um, that the biggest um, things that diminish empathy are often our un own unhealed pain. Um, and that we ourselves are the ones who know how to come through it. And so anytime we're engaging anyone in transforming like a belief system that is harmful to themselves and others, um, we do it through inquiry. Um, we do it with an assumption that um, people have the capacity to be better and our job is to draw it out, not to pour it in. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time and we still have questions, but it's better that way than wondering what to say, isn't it? Sure. Thank, do you have anything else you want to add here yet, Danielle? Thank you so much. You know, I just you. really, I appreciate the like, range and thoughtfulness of these questions. And I just, um, I think one of the things I love about the best of our movement is when we can both like be really anchored in both our courage and our humility at the same time. Um, so I'm like, don't, you know, I'm like, we should like not overestimate what we know and not underestimate what we can do. Um, 
and there are enough of us um, to there are enough of us to grow this to the degree it deserves to be grown. I know that that's true. Um, and every time and every year as this movement um, gets broader and deeper, I'm more and more encouraged about what else is possible. Oh my, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, I've, everybody. Yeah, this is great. I hope the rest of your afternoon isn't too hectic or what's left of it. I guess <laughs> I'm, I'm halfway through a 14 hour day, so. Emails right. are gonna, they're going to be drafts, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. All right, uh, let's see. Michaela, take over here for a little bit. Hi, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Uh, to Danielle. This was a really wonderful webinar and I'm really appreciative. Everybody, my name is Michaela Waters Crittenton and I'm a, grad I'm a graduate student here at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I'm the graduate assistant for the Zare Institute and I have just a few announcements for you. But that's only if the slides cooperate. Oh, there we go. So this is, a list, this is our list of our upcoming webinars. Please uh, note the dates and if you're interested in more information about how to register and um, you can visit our website. Uh, the link is there at the bottom. So Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, otherwise known as SPAR, is a research-based training program that combines uh, neurobiology, conflict transformation, human security, spirituality, restorative justice, and is designed for individuals and organizations whose work brings them into contact with people who have experienced um, historic and current trauma. Um, if you're interested in participating or have any questions, you can follow the link there below. Uh, our graduate certificate in restorative justice is an 18 credit hour certificate with equal focus given to conflict analysis and practice. You can complete the certificate through a number of courses offered with our Summer Peace Building Institute or through a combination of one semester on campus and one summer session. For more information, please follow the link at the bottom. Restorative justice and education. If you are interested in the intersection of RJ and education, we offer a master's in education with a restorative justice emphasis, as well as a 15 hour graduate certificate in restorative justice and education. This can be used by a variety of professionals working in educational settings. There is also a master's degree in conflict transformation and restorative justice, which is my own program. The curriculum is practice based and ideal for individuals looking to be reflective practitioners within their chosen fields. Last but certainly not least, the Zare Institute website is available as a source for upcoming events and has the schedule for our upcoming webinars. It's also a repository for past webinars that are linked to YouTube. The recording for tonight's webinar will be available within the next 48 hours. That does conclude all of my announcements, and I'll turn it back over to Howard Zare with a few closing remarks. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you to all of you who joined us. As Danielle said, these have been some really good questions. I wish we had more time, uh, but we covered, we covered a lot of them. Um, and I hope you all have a good holiday, and do join us in January. Uh, the webinars for January and February, I think, are up on our website, but we'll be adding the other ones shortly. So uh, join us again and have a good holiday. Good Thank night you. to all of you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.